Welcome back. My name is Benjamin Heridans with Channel 6, Fox 35. Thank you for joining me for tonight's segment of The Lockdown Drill, where we discuss education news and uncover what's really going on in America's classrooms. Tonight, we revisit a story from February of 2023, where a young man is seen on camera assaulting a school employee. The high school paraprofessional was left concussed and with multiple broken ribs, the student leaving the school building in handcuffs under the custody of Florida's great law enforcement officers. Since then, this violent criminal has been processed through the judicial system, and now we've received news that he will be sentenced to five years in prison, which is a sentencing all too light. Now, it's not often I get political folks. Here at Fox 35, we strive to bring you the most empirical and objective reporting possible. <laughs> but it is in cases like these where we need to return to law and order in and our order. school buildings. We need more police officers in more classrooms maintaining the peace. Punishments must be doled out to keep our schools safe. Because without our schools, who will raise the next generation of patriots to lead our country's future? Be sure to join us for tomorrow's segment of The Lockdown Drill, where we discuss universal free school lunch, feeding kids, or woke communist propaganda. What? What do you mean the kid has special needs? Everybody has special needs, David. What do you, let's just, how about, you know who has special needs? Our donors who need to see my pretty face doing what I do right here, right now. All right? You Gen Z interns, go give me some coffee and I'll take care of the rest of this. Mark, what is up with these new kids, huh? Is it their phones? Is it, is it, is it the woke propaganda? TikTok, it, they're all talking about human decency and human rights and, 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 and you know, oh, inclusion. And oh my goodness. I am, am so sorry. Um, I, I think my uncle found my uh, channel password. He keeps asking me for pictures of Spider-Man. Um, but hey, yeah, uh, welcome back to the actual quiet part. Uh, satire is over now. Um, so, uh, listen, I, I did actually want to talk about um, this sort of situation in general. Um, I mean, I mean, the first things to say really plainly are like actual harm was caused here. Right, like this this paraprofessional lady who who got hurt got hurt really badly. Um, this kid is in prison now. He's eighteen now, and and you know I mean that's one place to start. This is a complicated thing. He's a young man. He's a kid. He's a child. He's an adult technically now. Um, this is a kid that had many comorbid uh, mental health, developmental, and, and educational disorders and dispositions. There's some context here. Apparently, the paraprofessional took this student's Nintendo Switch, um, which in his individualized education plan, which is a legal document that helps serve uh, students with exceptional needs, in the IEP, it says, don't take this kid's tech it will trigger uh, an aggressive response. Uh, maybe not always violent, but a, a, a response that is very difficult to deal with and is going to get in the way of things. Um, <laughs> the, the, the fact that <laughs> a, a gaming console, a piece of connected technology uh, is involved in this is like its own entire discussion. And I think that gets very much down to like a discussion of parenting and, and like what led to this stuff. But I mean, that, that's what went down. Uh, apparently also I've heard that this school, um, it, it, it said it's, it's standard operating procedure, which I hate that phrase, but you know, this paraprofessional probably wasn't supposed to be exceptionally alone with this student with such high needs. There should have, I believe, been a, a special education professional in the room. Um, but it, it, the situation is just so much more complicated than, than just you know, saying it's one thing or another that's going on. Um, but I, I do think there is one thing that you can sort of pull from this situation. And it, it's that something is not working correctly, right? Um, how does a normal school day start fresh like it always does and ends up with a paraprofessional assaulted, violently, physically assaulted, 
um, battered, bruised, end up in the hospital, and then a kid in prison for five years. Um, it, 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 clearly, something is not working correctly. So I've, I've said it before, I've leveraged it uh, many times, but I have a degree in education. Um, I worked as a teacher, a professional high school teacher for three years. Um, I'm gonna be a substitute teacher for the time being. And uh, yeah, so I, I have experience with this field and I have a lot of thoughts about it. And, and the purpose of this channel and the purpose of this video is to talk about what I think is being missed in the discourse surrounding not just this particular event with this uh, kid from Florida and the paraprofessional got hurt horribly. I, it's not just this, like this is far bigger than what happened in this one situation, in this one anecdote that we're looking at. <clears throat> now, I, I'm just gonna be forthright. Like, the channel's called The Quiet Part. I have a video where I talk about my dispositions, my agenda. Um, I don't think prison is going to fix anything for this kid. Is removing the kid from the setting in which he was in going to produce positive outcomes? For him, probably not. Um, especially if the alternative is prison. For the rest of that school building, yeah, 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 like, it, yes. And, and that's kind of the thing I wanna talk about is in education, there's a long history surrounding the concept of inclusion when it concerns students of exceptional needs. So the, the word you're probably more used to is just special ed students, right? Special needs kids or whatever. Um, I like to use the language of exceptional because it also includes the gifted kids and just any kid that doesn't fit into the, the norm. Um, and by the end of this video, I, I hope to make an argument for why I wish the word exceptional didn't even have to exist. Something I wanted to tie this to is that Alabama, the state of Alabama recently signed something called a teacher's bill of rights. And I find that these two things happening at, at kind of a similar time to each other are uh, akin to fate. Um, it, it makes sense that all these things are happening at the same time. And something I want to discuss here is weighing inclusion, right, against risk. And then also a discussion of whether or not legislation like this Alabama Teachers Bill of Rights is really going to fix things. Um, shouldn't surprise you, I don't, I don't think legislation is going to save us, but I'm gonna outline exactly how this works. So in terms of the Teachers Bill of Rights, and I will connect this back to what happened with this young man at a point, the Alabama Education Association, which sounds to me like uh, Alabama's biggest teacher union because most states have a big education association, that is their teachers union. They lobbied for this bill of rights. Um, the guy that oversees government relations with this union used the language, literally, I quote, of law and order. So to the public, that can be reduced to an issue weighing restorative justice against punitive action and risk management, right? So you talk about restorative justice, you talk about the school to prison pipeline, um, and then you talk about risk management, right? Like. If we're going to have schools and there's gonna be more than a couple of people in them at a given time, risk is something we're going to be involving ourselves with. And there will always be students whose behaviors present genuine risks to the people in that school building. So how do we weigh these things against each other? Well, I think instead of schools trying to be a cure for these affected students, I think schools should really be focusing on getting out of the way as much as possible. So let, let's talk a little bit about the specifics I saw from this Bill of Rights. So the bill was introduced and it was being signed or, or whatever in early 2024, I believe it was February. The bill was written to allow teachers to kick out students and have them in the care of the principal. And then it sets the capacity for the principal to determine the method for re-entry for those students. And then they're allowed to make a decision to suspend or refer the student to an alternative school, which is a different way of saying expelling, right? You're expelling, you're saying I'm, I'm referring them to here, which means I don't want them here. One of the goals of the bill is to provide, and I'm gonna quote this, to provide immunity to education employees for civil and criminal actions related to the performance of their duties. That's called qualified immunity. That's the thing that police officers have, where like if they manhandle someone and they die, the police officer themselves can't be sued. You can only sue the police department. And boy, is that a, f uh, that's a lot. Um, there are a lot of issues with the fact that 
uh, uh, police officers have qualified immunity. Holy shit. Like, I mean, it's just a free for all at that point. Um, now there's also a rational perspective that qualified immunity is something you just kind of need because you're rolling dice every single day, right? Like if you're wrangling all of these kids every day, at some point you're going to accidentally like step on one of their feet and trip them. And like a kid knocks out a tooth or something and you're liable for oral surgery. Like I, I get it. It, Risk management is an instinct that people have. I, I think it's a, a socially inherited instinct that we're kind of conditioned towards. Um, and, and yeah, shit does happen. Like random, unexpected things do in fact happen. Now, uh, this bill uses a lot of the language surrounding the concept of disorderly conduct, which I myself as a student, I've been on the other end of disorderly conduct. And I hate the concept of disorderly conduct. It is the most loosey-goosey definition possible that allows you as much power over students as you could possibly want to manifest. So disorderly conduct is defined in this bill as any conduct that intentionally disrupts, disturbs, or interferes with the teaching of students or disturbs the peace, order, or discipline at any school. Now, I want you to notice something. That is a really long and really loosey-goosey definition for disorderly conduct, and it could be interpreted in about a thousand different ways. And that's just been put into a bill in hopes that like, you'll fix this issue where uh, teachers are, are dealing with, with crazy uh, situations and students that are disorderly or whatever. Like, that is just completely dangerous is, is how, what I think of it. But at some point, these rulings and definitions are going to be used to oppress and impose power and hierarchy on students in a way that I consider indecent and inhuman. Okay, you can talk about human rights, which honestly human rights are their own thing because they only exist if they're written. I don't think they have to be written. Kids deserve respect. They deserve humanity, autonomy, independence. I, I am a fan of the concept of youth liberation. The thing I wanna tie back to, right? I've, I've discussed specific language um, from this Bill of Rights, right? So I'm, I'm gonna begin introducing my proposal for this, right? We, we talk about weighing inclusion against restorative justice, student autonomy with risk management in the school building. And my answer is really, really simple, but it involves a concept that I have to introduce now that I don't expect many people are familiar with. I think you'll intuitively agree with and understand the concept. Um, and this is what it's called, the unification of means and ends. And in this case, I use the word means to refer to how a person operates or how a person does or builds something. And then ends being the outcome of what it is a person is doing. The unification of means and ends is an idea where if you plant an apple seed, you expect an apple tree. Now, I use that analogy on purpose because if you know much about gardening, there's this thing called being true to seed. Sometimes, Plants don't actually look exactly like the thing you think they're coming from. But what I'm saying is that the means a person uses to achieve social change or the framework through which a school district operates, those means are going to be connected to the outcomes you see in that school district or the behaviors and circumstances and interactions that exist in that school district and in those school buildings. You cannot plant an apple seed and expect a pumpkin, right? Like you, you just cannot do that. That is not a unification of ends with means. You, it's an unreasonable expectation. So here's the thing that I think isn't being discussed because I think it's something that people don't think about or are not talking enough about. It, it's being said quietly, but it's not being reflected on deeply. School in the United States is compulsory. Compulsory means you legally have to go to school until a certain age. I'm pretty sure that in some states you can qualify it as child neglect if a parent doesn't put their kid into a school of some sort at some point consistently over time, right? That's where the law, the legislation of truancy comes in. Truancy is a violation of law for not going to school consistently. You can get in trouble legally for not going to school, whether that be the parent's choice or the child's choice. School in the United States is not an option. You have to go to school. So I think that is something that is being wholly and completely disregarded in these discussions. You have students with exceptional needs and limited options, right? School districts do not have a thousand schools 
They have so and so many schools and hopefully with some diversity, right? Different approaches. They talk about alternative schools. I used to teach at an alternative school. Okay, I understand the value of a school having a different approach to meet different needs for different students. Alternative schools are schools of different means that produce different ends, right? The focus isn't on the normal traditionally tracked student. The focus is on taking kids who have exceptional needs and trying to meet those needs while also helping them learn. Different means, different ends. But school in the United States is compulsory. You have to go, even if the options are crap. And I'm not just talking like public versus private. I'm talking like most of them. Again, school districts in the United States use certain means to produce certain ends. And in particular, the United States uses something called the Prussian model for learning. It's a factory model, right? There's a person in the front of the room with authority called the teacher who knows everything on whatever it is they're teaching. And then all the children in the room are lined up under that authority and expected to be filled with that teacher's knowledge, right? There are empty vessels waiting to be filled, and learning is something that happens when it's forced down with authority. Now, people with modern education backgrounds understand that that's not constructivist at all and, and not particularly effective. If that is the framework through which a school operates, one focused on getting as many students as educated as quickly and cheaply as possible, that doesn't leave room for exceptions. That, that literally does not leave room for people and children that are in different circumstances. And whether it be a disability that someone's born with, or how about this, right? Like, like bite on this for a bit. Life doesn't wait until we're 18. Like life does not wait for us. You, you know that, you've been through things, you've had experiences like I have, where you've realized when you were a kid, sometimes stuff isn't great. In, in, in fact, there's this entire issue in the United States of sort of uh, um, mythologizing the teenage years as being like perfect and great, but they are periods of change and life waits for no one. It doesn't wait for you to turn 18. And yet the framework under which our schools operate is one wherein you have to be done in a certain amount of time. And you have to follow a certain number of rules and hit a certain number of standards and demonstrate a certain level of competency. And you have to sit down, follow the rules and not obstruct the learning environment. You talk about obstruction of peace and order and discipline, but who's doing the actual obstructing? <laughs> School is compulsory in the United States. We are legally binding kids to come to these places even if they don't work correctly for them at their pace to meet their needs. We have lots and lots of legal precedent due to the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, the IDEA. And I think that is where the sort of like liberal side comes into the discussion. The concept that people use, the side that people take when looking at what happened in Florida with this young man that assaulted this uh, education employee, people talk about the least restrictive environment. Students with exceptional needs, special needs, need to be placed in the least restrictive environment possible. That means they should not be isolated from their peers. They should not be taken out of classroom and completely isolated from everyone else. And they should have as much access to learning as possible. But when we talk about access to learning and, and access at all, that's where the compulsory part demonstrates some problems. You're compelling kids to go to school even if schools are not adequately ready made to meet those children's needs. And then you talk about the broader problems with education with the fact that schools are funded off of property taxes, which is completely inequitable. And then the fact that there are lots of things about the model we use, the Prussian or factory model, that limit the ability to meet the needs of exceptional students, that demonstrate even violent behaviors that aren't traditional and hard to deal with. It's not the least restrictive environment to take a kid who has exceptional needs and put them somewhere where they cannot be adequately treated. And most importantly, you are compelling that child to do that. You are legally binding that that kid has to go somewhere. And so you just throw them wherever. You throw a paraprofessional to deal with them and that school rolls dice every day, every day. I've seen this as an educator. They roll dice every day. And then at some point things are fine until they're not. And that paraprofessional gets assaulted. Right? This kid ends up in prison. This is not good for anyone. This is bad for everyone. This is not bueno. You cannot out-engineer a bad design. We, we, we cannot out-paraprofessional a shitty school system. 
but that will never happen. We will never meet the needs of kids that are extraordinarily different. If all of our schools look the exact same and the entire premise is to be as efficient and, 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 and work on a shoestring budget as possible. Like we, that's just not going to happen. You cannot expect anything you do to modify such a school framework to ever produce the ends that you actually want because you're not using the right means. These frameworks do not work. So here's, here's sort of my quote that I kind of made together. I'm sure I stole it from someone. You cannot out-legislate your way out of a broken framework. It's using broken means which only lead to more broken ends. It, it doesn't solve the problem. So the quiet part for this episode, the thing that I'm, I'm trying to say loudly is that we cannot expect our school systems to meaningfully change if we try to legislate our way out of bad frameworks altogether. You're, you're never going to take a factory model school and turn it into a place of meaningful inclusion so long as it continues operating like a business in a factory. That's not going to happen. I'm not always the best at proposing solutions. Um, I don't always think I'm particularly rational when it comes to proposing meaningful, implementable solutions. I'm, I'm kind of a lazy person that just talks about issues. But I do take responsibility. If I'm gonna talk so much about the problem, I might as well propose a solution. It is not enough to desire something. If you really want it, adequate means must be used to secure it. So here's my call to action to you. If you really care about education and the education of your children or other children or the future and, and all these kinds of generally related things, if you really care, get into a classroom. If it, if it is something that you can do, volunteer to be a paraprofessional. And if you don't like volunteering because you need money and we all need money, become a substitute teacher. The <laughs> requirements are exceptionally low and accessible. I guarantee you are almost qualified to be a substitute teacher. I encourage you to encourage the people you know, and if you can yourself, to get into the school buildings and develop an understanding of what is actually going on. Because no amount of me reporting is ever going to convince you that the things I've seen are real and that they are actually happening because they are simply unbelievable. But not to me anymore because I understand that the means we are using will only produce the ends that we are seeing. Kids being literally left behind and things not working out and then the prison pipeline. Of course, that's what's going to happen. We, we operate our schools like they're a monopoly. It's not, gonna, it's not gonna go any way other than that. If you can get into the classroom or at least try to develop an understanding of, of what education really looks like in the United States right now, the thing you do after that is support and advocate for a complete systemic change to the way we do education in the United States. But you're not gonna be informed on how to do that or what that looks like until you understand what's really going on in these classrooms. So get out there, get connected, talk with people, connect with teachers, encourage the young people in your life to take a shot at being a substitute teacher because they will leave that experience unbelievably more informed than it found them. Now, I've, I've said it several times already, the issue in this situation, to some extent, comes down to the fact that schools are compulsory, but schools are not equipped to actually meet the needs of diverse learners, right? I am saying that I don't think schools should be compulsory anymore. I, I think that if you cannot adequately prove that a school is equipped and capable of meeting the needs of these children, they should not be forced to attend them. At least not schools following this current framework which leads back into a continued debate about private and public schools and all this other crap. I don't think that private schools will save us. I don't think legislation will save us. I think a fundamental revolutionary shift in the way that we do education is our only real option. And if we want that fundamental and revolutionary change to happen, we have to take fundamental and revolutionary action. Get into your community, connect with people, develop an understanding, and begin the process of mutual aid. Connect with people, understand what the problem is in order to begin thinking about how to solve it. Now, if you want more specific examples and what I think a, a better system would look like, I recommend you check out my village schooling video, which is a thing that I did to try and answer the question of, what would education be like if we used a different system and how could that system be engineered for people instead of efficiency, instead of profit, instead of property tax, instead of all these things that have the educational framework we currently operate under not working to really meet the needs of everyone that it can. Village schooling is the answer I made up to that. And it's a work in progress. I'm constantly kind of changing and thinking more deeply about my ridiculous idea. 
Um, but if that interests you, if, if you want answers to how to fix things, I encourage you to check out that video. Um, it was a pretty good one and I put a lot of work into it. And with that, I want to thank you for watching this video. Um, if you're not subscribed, I'd encourage you to get subscribed. Be sure to like this video if you liked it. Share it with others. Did you know about this uh, Alabama Teachers Bill of Rights? Did you know about that? Um, did you know that was even happening? Did you know that like a certain percentage of teachers are regularly assaulted just in their line of work? Um, check out my video on Are Teachers Okay? Um, yeah, it's pretty bad. And uh, thank you for watching again. Um, again, I, I do encourage you to share this video uh, with people in, in spaces where you think these ideas resonate or are of interest. Um, take care. Bye-bye.